okay so welcome back and uh, so now is the moment of uh, the francesca carnivale prize which is a prime a, pri a, a prize that the ASE gives to the best thesis master or bachelor in economic history we have a committee of uh, distinguished scholar to select the thesis this year the committee was uh, co was uh, the members of the committee were Valeria Pinchera, Carlo Ciccarelli and Gabriele Cappelli. And so we are, Valeria is next to me and she will announce the winner of the prize. It's better to use the microphone. So it's a great pleasure to chair the, this session, uh, the prize, uh, the Francesca Carnevale Prize. So this year it was quite difficult for the committee to award the prize because uh, we received a large number of submissions and also the quality of some of dissertation was really, really high. So, uh, Thanks also to the dissemination and the, com and the communication of the prize through social media. We received uh, 20 theses, mainly from abroad, uh, about 70%, and from eight different countries, from Canada to France, UK, and so on, and uh, numerous uh, institution, national and international, such as University of Oxford, London School of Economics, uh, University of British Columbia. And uh, so the process of dissertation analysis and evaluation has been very challenging and stimulated at the same time uh, because of the different topics. So ranging from uh, pre-industrial economic inequality, determinants uh, of political disorder and gender and labor, just uh, to mention a few, and uh, the different approaches and methods adopted. So we evaluated the thesis uh, in terms of originality, consistency, and uh, also discussion of implication with respect to the economic history field. And we, after some discussion, but really peaceful, <laughs> so we finally agreed to award the thesis that uh, more clearly and significantly uh, contributes to the economic history research, selecting as winner uh, Michele Bolla, from Bocconi University. Supervisor Guido Alfani uh, with the dissertation entitled Everyone is Faced with the Same Present Income Inequality in the Roman Empire. 165 AD, a provincial level approach. So, Michele, congratulations yeah, for your exit. Yeah, we don't have anything to do. Thank you very much. We don't have uh, something to do any token, maybe next year, but uh, you will receive the prize. Uh, now we, we, you give our, 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 your bank coordinates and you will receive the yet, prize. So it's, uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so you are be waiting and next week you receive the, thank you the prize. Much. Congratulations thank you. again. And thanks again to the selecting committee. Okay. So now we come to the as a keynote lecture. So I'm very glad that uh, to introduce you, Jochen Streb, who is a dear colleague and friend. And uh, he will be, he's in Fortuna, he's in Germany because uh, uh, he was supposed to be in Pisa, but uh, he's playing yesterday at the technical break, uh, breakdown. Uh, this is a misfortune, but uh, I think it is better that uh, the mis this technical uh, 
problems take place when the plane is on the ground rather than flying. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's not be too sad about that. So Jochen has done major contributions to German economic history, so innovation, but also social security. And uh, he has also published in economics, economic history journal, but also business history. So he, he is really a wide ranging economic historians. And so I'm really glad that, to, that uh, he is the, he's accepted to give the keynote lecture. And uh, so you can, you can share the slide, you can go ahead. And uh, we would like to also to keep some time for questions afterwards. If you ask the questions, you have to come here so that you can hear. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored uh, to give uh, this keynote here. Uh, well, I, I, I would have loved to be here, but well, uh, you're right. The breakdown was better on, on the on the run, running field than uh, in the air. So I share my screen. I think you, you all can see it. Uh, okay, then I'll start. The, the title of my talk is, is Patent Law. Uh, with, so I will talk a little bit about law uh, and patents and uh, the influence of this patent law on, on economic performance. And let me start uh, my, my presentation with, with Serena Khan, who uh, recently published a, a second book uh, about this question. And in this book, she said, well, a lot of people are asking why was Britain the, the first country to industrialize? But, but she wants to ask why was America uh, taking the, the leading role uh, as a productivity and technology leader in the, in the 20th century? And her answer, well, uh, to make it short, it's a little bit more complicated, but I think uh, in, in a nutshell, her answer is that uh, uh, the U.S. introduced uh, a very successful patent law in, in the 19th century, especially it had low fees. And because of these low fees, it encouraged a lot of innovation uh, from, from uh, the working class and from people with, with lower income. And so we had more innovation and, and we had also more division of labor between inventors and companies. And because of these many innovations, uh, there was a high growth of productivity and production in the US and the US became the, the richest and success, most successful uh, economic country of the world in the 20th century. Uh, this is uh, the, the main hypothesis uh, she's uh, uh, discussing in, in both her books. Uh, and well, uh, let's look at this hypothesis. Uh, and if you look at cost of patenting, and this is uh, I've taken from a from a paper from 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 Alessandro and Michelangelo, uh, and they took it from from a discussion paper by Lerner. And this is the cost of patenting uh, in different countries. Uh, and you see, of course, the, the cost of patenting in the US are, are, are very low compared uh, to the patent fees, for example, in the UK uh, or in Germany uh, or, or even in Italy. So this is the, the, the first part of, of, of Serena's uh, claim that the patent fees were, were low in the US uh, uh, in, in contrast to, to the European countries. By the way, the, the German number here is wrong because this is just uh, 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 looking at the Russian uh, patent system, but there are a lot of other patent systems uh, in Germany at this uh, time. And if you look for for the whole Germany, you would have uh, uh, nearly the same number than later after the German unification. So, okay, the first part is clear. The US had uh, cheap fees. So what's going on now? And here I have uh, data on, on catching up. Uh, so we have here relative GDP per capita, UK uh, 100. And you see, of course, that the US uh, is catching up rapidly uh, and taking the lead uh, in 1913. So uh, more than 100% GDP per capita in the US compared uh, to the UK. But we have also uh, fast catching up processes in Switzerland and in Germany and not so in, in Italy and Spain. But what's, what's about the fees? And if you look, uh, well, the US have a low fee Germany has a very expensive patent fee, but still uh, it's catching up. Uh, Switzerland has no patent law at all. It's catching up. And Italy and Spain have comparatively low patent fees, but they are not catching up to the UK. So I think uh, catching up was, of course, not determined just by patent fees. We wouldn't have believed that. Uh, so 
the story is a little bit more complex. Also, when it comes uh, to the relationship between patent laws and 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 innovation, so I think uh, the patent law, on the one hand, has has uh, more characteristics than just the fees. Uh, it also uh, has uh, provisions about the maximum lifespan of a patent, uh, whether or not there is an examination system or just a registration system. Uh, sometimes the the laws specify the not no non patentability of certain products. There is often a compulsory working clause enforced or not, and we find often uh, some ways to to discriminate foreigners, at least in the 19th century. So. All these provisions interact then with with country characteristics, and uh, the countries, of course, uh, are different in in, in many dimensions. Uh, I just named a few here: uh, the size of the economy, the geography, the natural resources endowment. Uh, how what's about the human capital in a country? Uh, how does patent law interact with with other institutions uh, in this country? And and what is the state of the development uh, of the country uh, we look at? And so. If you have uh, this this interaction because this many provisions of the patent law and the many characteristics uh, of the of a country, it's not clear at all whether or not just uh, low patent fees uh, will uh, will explain uh, the rise to technological leadership. And um, this is what I will discuss today in my talk. I will discuss three channels. Uh, through which patent law can lead uh, to to more innovation activity in a country. So the first channel is that the patent law might increase domestic innovation activity. The second one is uh, that it fosters the, the import the import of technology of technology from abroad. And the third channel might be that uh, patent law can facilitate the financing of innovations, uh, whether they 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 come from from abroad or from from within the country. And well, of course, the second part is then that more innovation. Uh, through one or more of these channels will lead to higher economic growth. I will not discuss this hypothesis in this talk. This might be another talk <laughs> next year. I will uh, concentrate on the uh, uh, on the on the question how how patent law uh, influenced innovation, and then we 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 might uh, have another discussion about why more innovation will lead to higher economic growth. I, I try to to highlight some of the current controversies and and unanswered questions. Well. We are. We had uh, in the in the 1990s uh, mostly historical data about uh, American patents, but the the situation changed dramatically, at least uh, especially in the last uh, decade. I would say we have now a lot of patent data uh, all over the uh, Europe and other places. Uh, uh, I think uh, well inspired by the American research, uh, but but now uh, more sometimes also going uh, beyond that. What 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 the Americans have done, uh, uh, Sorina Khan uh, or Sokolov. So this is just the list. Uh, it's, it takes too much time to discuss all the uh, the fine contributions uh, of the people which which build up uh, these databases. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Alessandro plays also an important role. He worked on Great Britain and Italy. So uh, we, uh, but we have also now data from a lot of uh, Nordic countries like Finland, Norway, or, or Sweden. We have data on Japan and also now uh, data on, on Latin America, uh, Argentina, Cuba, Mexico. So it's not, we can now discuss the channels and the questions uh, I have uh, talked about uh, a couple of slides away. Uh, we can discuss now this question uh, uh, on basis of a lot of more examples than, than just the American case. And we can also contrast the results from other country to the American case. But the question is why, why all this data work? Why, why are we so much working on pattern statistics and has historical pattern statistics? Because we believe that by, by looking at patent data, we, we can cover an important part of a country's innovation or of a firm's innovation uh, on a smaller uh, level. So we think when, when observing uh, patent data, we, we, we can understand what is going on in a country when it comes to innovativeness. This is uh, the, the, the basic hypothesis. Without that, uh, it would make no sense to look to spend all this time on, on patent data and, and patent law. Well, Peter Moser uh, has another view uh, on this, uh, especially when it comes to the 19th century. 
she claimed uh, that, that patterns might not be a good measure for, for innovation. And uh, her claim is based on her research on, on World Fairs exhibits. And he looked on, on, on World Fairs exhibits lists, uh, for example, for the Christus, Crystal Palace uh, exhibition in London in, in 1851. And she looked at how much of this uh, exhibits uh, were patented and, and came to the result not so many. And so she said, well, uh, then if we believe that countries uh, uh, presented their most innovative goods at these world fairs, and if we find that they are not patented, then maybe patents are not so good a measure for uh, innovativeness of these countries. Giacomo Domini, for example, there are others uh, who, who don't share the view of, of Petra Mosa, uh, thinks this might not be true. Uh, so that uh, World Fairs exhibits are not uh, uh, innovative goods, but export goods. And export goods might not be innovative. Yeah. So uh, and, and often it's, it's not a good which is innovative, but the, the method to produce this good which is innovative. And uh, firms often do not present their innovative methods or machines at these fairs, but the goods produced with these innovative machines. So. So, well, this is uh, very uh, in contrast to, to Peter Moser's view. And what might be the, 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 the truth is somewhere in the middle. But, well, the, the stake I will, will take is that, well, patterns still uh, provide us a, a very, uh, the best uh, uh, measure we have to, to measure innovations in historical countries. By the way, we have uh, in, uh, we are in Pisa, at least you are, and uh, one of the uh, one one of the famous inventors uh, in the 19th century in Pisa was Antonio Pacinotti, who invented uh, an important uh, electromagnetic generator. And uh, the the interesting thing is that he never get a patent for this machine, uh, but uh, a medal of progress at the World Fairs uh, in Vienna. So uh, in some sense, uh, uh, we see if you measure innovativeness, uh, we would not observe his machine in the pattern data, but in the uh, World Fairs uh, exhibition data. Uh, but he also did not become a successful businessman, uh, but instead professor in physics uh, at the University of Pisa, which isn't so bad uh, too. But uh, maybe, uh, uh, well, if he had a more economic interest in his uh, research, he might have got a, got a patent. The second problem with, with patent data is that uh, they, they count every patent, and some patents uh, cover very important innovations and others not. Here's just a, a, a comparison, a German patent, uh, imperial patent uh, 532, is, is, is patenting the, the, the very important diesel motor by, by Otto Diesel. And uh, patent number 27,632 is uh, uh, patenting a device for, for cutting boiled eggs. Uh, you see here this nice picture. It's a very complicated uh, uh, machinery just to cut a boiled egg. But uh, this guy got a patent. Uh, I, I think he didn't become rich with this patent. So, if we look at just pure statics, statistics, uh, if we count every patent uh, the same, we have problems to distinguish this uh, valuable and more not so valuable patents. And then, therefore, a, a lot of uh, methods have been invented by researchers uh, to distinguish these two groups. Uh, uh, I don't want to say too much about it. There are mainly three, three methods. Uh, if you have renewal fees, you can uh, use the, the duration of a patent to measure its private value. Uh, this, uh, one of the first to do this for historical patents was Sullivan, uh, a very nice uh, approach also by, by, by Nubo Love, again by Michelangelo and Alessandro. Uh, today, uh, often uh, the most cited patents are identified as the most important patents. Uh, citations were not uh, common uh, before the Second World War. so so. A patent usually did not cite uh, uh, patents which uh, influenced the, the actual patent. Uh, but again, Alessandro found a nice way also to use this method for, for at least British uh, patents. And then we can uh, look at patents also filed abroad, which are a subset uh, of the patents uh, filed at home, because inventors all, it costs uh, additional money to, to file a patent abroad. So inventors only did this when uh, 
they 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 patent was very successful in the home market and so they tried to get it also uh, patented the innovation in the in the foreign market so these are three methods uh, to identify the valuable patents now i will come to my three channels i want to discuss and the, the first channel is uh, the the channel which looks at uh, how the patent law might increase innovation at home well, the, the classical incentive argument is uh, that inventors have to fear imitation. And uh, of course, uh, to invent a, a new product, a new procedure, they have to spend a, a lot of money, a lot of time. And if it's easy to, if they succeed and it's very easy to imitate the invention, then uh, their competitors, uh, they could uh, uh, they could supply at a lower price because they would not have to, to cover the, the research and development costs. Uh, and so uh, there, if, if, if a potential inventor thinks about this, this disadvantages, uh, he, he will not invent at all. Today, you hear this argument uh, mostly or, or most prominently uh, by, by pharmaceutical firms uh, inventing uh, uh, COVID medicine, COVID, COVID drugs uh, or, or, or drugs against uh, AIDS, which say we have a lot of uh, money spent to develop these drugs and if we don't get a patent uh, and don't get the, the monopoly uh, rents we, we got from the patent, we would not have the incentive to, to invent at all. There are other positive side effects of the patent law. Uh, uh, the one is that uh, the, uh, if, you, if you get a patent, you have this closure, uh, your innovation in a, in a patent specification and uh, others can read this. And this might lead uh, to, to rapid dissemination of new techn technological knowledge, which might be uh, used in, 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 in for other inventions in the neighborhood of the of the patented invention. Uh, then we, we we can trade patents, which is also nice. So we can sell patents, and this allows uh, the, the selling of new technology, of new ideas, and uh, this might lead to a division of labor between the inventors, which concentrate on in inventing things, and and the companies, which concentrate on 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 producing the, the new things and, and sell them in the markets. And this is this uh, idea of division of labor between inventors and, and companies, which is also uh, very prominent in, in Serena Khan's work, uh, among others. Well, I said things are more complex. Uh, the, the cheapest uh, patent law in history uh, was the, the patent law of Prussia, where the patent fees were very low, even lower than in the US. Uh, and here we have uh, patent statistics, uh, patents per year and million inhabitants. And you see that the, the numbers are, are very, very small in Prussia, even though it was so easy and so, uh, and so cheap to get a patent. In Bavaria, which was a backward country in, in this time, uh, mostly agricultural production at low productivity, uh, there was a much higher number of, of patents per year and, 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 and a million inhabitants. So how, how, how could it come? And the, the answer is that Prussian, Russia had not only a very low patent fee, it had also a very restrictive granting policy. So every patent application uh, was, was scrutinized uh, for, for novelty and most of the, of the patents uh, which were applied for were judged not to be very new. And so uh, the, the, the Prussian patent office declined uh, to give uh, the, the applicant a patent. So uh, you, so, you can have uh, very low fees uh, and also a very low number of, of, of patents, which here depends on the on the granting policy, on the examine on the novelty examination. So we learn from that that uh, patent fees are not uh, low patent fees are not a necessary or uh, are not a sufficient uh, condition for for high numbers of patents. And we also learn from from, from that, of course, that it might be very misleading to to compare. The pattern statistics of, of, of different countries, uh, not in, in some way or the other, controlling for these differences in law. A second example from, from Italy uh, Alessandro and Michelangelo uh, researched uh, what happened after the, the introduction of the, of the uh, Italian patent law of, of 1864, uh, where the patent fees uh, were the renewal fees, the patent fee, and uh, also the renewal fees were, were comparatively uh, low. Uh, for example, in comparison to the UK or Germany. And they, they find that of really here in this case, uh, the, low, the low patent fee lead 
to more inventions and especially also to more uh, uh, inventions or patented inventions by by private inventors so uh, this go this is the part which which fits very well to serena khan's claim but uh, the second part of the finding does not because they also find that uh, the patterns, the additional patterns uh, produced after the, this low fee was introduced were uh, on average uh, of a low quality, especially when they were patented by, by private inventors. And they, they explain it by, by the low human capital in, in Italy at this uh, point of time. So we see low patent fees can lead to more patterns, but uh, not necessarily also to more valuable patterns. And then we have this case uh, uh, where countries without the patent law uh, uh, excelled in innovation activity. Uh, uh, especially we have here the two cases of the Netherlands, which had no patent law uh, between uh, 1870 and, and uh, the beginning, and shortly before the First World War, and, and Switzerland, which had no patent law in the 19th century. And this allows firms uh, of these countries to imitate uh, foreign technology without uh, costs, without uh, paying licensing fees or stuff like that. And a nice example here is uh, Philips in, in the Netherlands, uh, which, uh, which uh, imitated uh, the Edison's light bulb. And this was, uh, well, the founding of, of a today a very large uh, company. Uh, in, in the Switzerland, uh, firms uh, imitated the, the German dye, the synthetic dyes, uh, and became large and very successful. So, so we have this, uh, this idea that uh, uh, having not a patent law might be very good for, for developing countries or for countries trying to catch up. Uh, Peter Moser argued uh, that, uh, well, having no patent law also meant that uh, when, when it comes to, to own innovativeness, firms concentrated on, on goods which are not easily to imitate, where secrecy is a, is a very good means to, to, to appropriate the returns of innovation. And uh, uh, such, for example, uh, in the, in the uh, consumer industries uh, like like milk chocolate or ready-made soups so it's might be not a, not an accident that uh, firms like Toplarone and and Maggi also uh, uh, rose uh, in countries without a patent law in germany we had a patent law we had a patent law even uh, a lot of patent laws before the introduction of the imperial patent law in in, the, in 1877 uh, but in all these patent laws, uh, it was not allowed uh, to, to patent a new chemical product. It was also al only allowed to, to patent a new method uh, or a method to produce a new chemical product. So if you uh, get a patent for this, for this procedure, for this method, uh, uh, no competitor was allowed to produce the new product with this method. But if he uh, found another method, he was free to do so. And so this, uh, the argument is that this allowed for, for more competition because uh, a lot of firms could try just uh, to, to find another way to produce a successful product. And uh, so more competition led uh, to more innovation, to, uh, to lower prices, uh, to lower costs, and which uh, increased uh, after a period of time also, uh, or which, which lead to the technology uh, world leadership of, of German uh, uh, chemical firms. Here we have an example from Murman, where you see that the, the, the market entry of new firms uh, in, in Germany was, was much higher than, uh, for example, in Britain and the US, where you could patent uh, a new uh, chemical product. Second channel, technological transfer uh, from abroad. We, we have a, a very uh, important uh, books and research on, on industrial espionage and technology transfer in the, in the 18th and 19th century uh, after the English in industrialization where, where other firms uh, where firms from other countries tried to uh, to imitate this new technology uh, by sending uh, spies by by working in these innovative companies by by smuggling out new machines uh, or drawings of these or by hiring skilled uh, foreign workers here, I, I want to discuss with you uh, whether it might be possible to, to promote the uh, import of foreign technology also by, by means of the patent law. And I think we have two, two provisions in the, in the historical patent laws, which are rather poorly researched. 
but which might help us to understand what was going on uh, with with the patent law and uh, introduction uh, and uh, the foreign uh, uh, the import of foreign technology the the first thing is the patents uh, of introduction uh, in most historical patents uh, uh, laws you find the idea that local imitators uh, can uh, get a patent of introduction when when they introduce in their own country uh, a foreign innovation uh, even without consent of the original foreign inventor so they they have just to be the first one to to do this product uh, in in this in the home country and then we have compulsory working clauses uh, where where every patentee but this is also mostly against foreign patentees uh, had to produce the patented in invention within the jurisdiction of the patent protection otherwise the patent would elapse and so uh, it was not easy for a foreigner to, to get a patent in an important market, say in Germany or in Italy, and, and not producing the good in this market because then uh, the patent protects perhaps very soon. We could learn from the structure of the patents of introduction, so what, what, what technologies are they dealing with, or from the enforced mandat mandatory working clauses uh, on which areas uh, technology, technology imports were concentrated, but this has not been done uh, uh, in most cases. So this is, like I said, poorly under-researched. Uh, a good example, uh, or the, the only example uh, where, where this is done better is the Spanish case by, by Patricio Saiz, uh, who, who looked uh, really on the patterns of introduction and invention, the classical ones in Spain uh, for, the, for the 18th, 19th, 20th century. And, and here you see that at the beginning, uh, uh, patents of, of in introduction were as important as, as patents uh, uh, of invention. And even uh, after the, the patents of invention took the lead, uh, there's still a high share of, of patents of introduction in the Spanish economy, even until the 1930s. So you could say Spain run uh, to a two-stage process. First, uh, when, when, the, when the country was uh, was very low on, on technology. They, they tried to imitate uh, mostly foreign technology. And then when they become better in, in doing a new technology stuff, they, they also uh, increase their, their own you know, invention activities, but still relying on a lot of uh, patterns of introduction. And they size also uh, looked at the, at the structure. And you could believe that uh, this, this patterns of introduction concentrated mostly on the on the most advanced foreign technologies, but uh, uh, this, this might be misleading to think so, because uh, it could also be the case that there must be some, some complementary be between the, the home base, the, the human capital and the knowledge in the, in the imitating country and the technology they want to imitate. Uh, otherwise, it would not work. And you see here that, for example, uh, the patterns of the introduction are, are, are uh, very, very uh, above proportional in, in textile, uh, where this, the Spanish uh, economy was was well equipped uh, to deal with new mach machinery and stuff in textile, but less so, for example, in electricity. So they, they concentrated their patterns of introduction not on the uh, high, high-tech uh, patterns of, of this period in time, but on the patterns, the foreign patterns, which might work also in a Spanish economy. The compulsory working clause, uh, in some sense, always worked for for the country which introduced it in its but in its patent law on the on the one hand uh, if the if the foreign patent holder complied with the compulsory working clause he he will bu uh, build up a new production facility in the in the foreign country and uh, in, in this way uh, the the workers and employees in this country became familiar with the foreign uh, technology with the production and sales of this foreign innovation this is a good thing learning by doing is increased uh, when the compulsory working clause uh, is accepted by the foreign patent patentee. If not, if the foreign patentee did not satisfy the compulsory working clause, then the patent protection expired, like I said, and the domestic producers were, were given free reign to legally imitate the invention described in the patent specification very soon, which might be also good. But well, nobody has researched the effects. Uh, at least uh, Patricio uh, Saiz again uh, showed that uh, most of the foreign patents in the German case uh, were not implemented. Um, so, well, about, let's say, uh, 
uh, three quarters uh, or even more of the foreign patents were not implemented and therefore elapsed very soon. But uh, uh, still, I cannot answer the question uh, whether the Spanish companies benefited from uh, from the uh, from this non-implementation by by getting the innovative knowledge ahead of schedule. We have in the early patent laws uh, formal discrimination of, of foreign inventors, uh, for example, in the, in the American one. Uh, in the first patent law, uh, only US citizens were allowed to apply for a patent, no foreigners at all. This uh, was relaxed uh, in, the, in the coming decades. Uh, and the Patent Act of 1836 then uh, allowed also foreigners uh, living outside the US to get a patent in the US. But, and this is interesting, they had to pay a, a much higher patent fee than the domestic inventors, especially the British inventors had to pay uh, $500 uh, for American patent, uh, which was much more than other nationalities have to pay uh, and, and much, much more than the Americans have to pay. At the end of the 19th century, uh, there was uh, international movement to get rid of this formal uh, discrimination of foreigners, uh, uh, ending with the Paris Convention and, uh, of 1883. And in this uh, Paris Convention, there was the principle of national treatment introduced and that required that, that each national patent law had to treat uh, domestic and foreign patenters, the, the patentees the same way. So from this moment on, uh, formal discrimination was not longer possible in, in the sense that uh, it was not advisable uh, anymore to, to build the, the discrimination clauses into the patent law. Now, if you wanted to discriminate uh, foreigners, uh, you had to do it uh, in administrative practice or in uh, in law uh, at the courts. And there are a lot of uh, examples that this happened uh, afterwards, uh, still in the in the 20th and 21st century. I, I want to show you an example from Württemberg. Uh, Wittenberg, uh, one of the uh, today one of the most innovative parts uh, of the German economy uh, in the 19th century, a backward uh, a county uh, region in Germany, and uh, Wittenberg had a very special patent law in the sense that uh, it allowed the patent authority to to assign to each individual patent uh, 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 an individual patent fee ranging between five and twenty guilders per year. So they they could decide uh, whether to 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 charge five or ten or fifteen or twelve, whatever. And if you look at the distribution of fees, you see that uh, some uh, inventors had to pay more depending on on their country of origin. Uh, for example, uh, the people from France, the people from Great Britain, uh, from Saxony, which was also a, a a highly developed uh, country had to pay higher fees than the than the people uh, from Württemberg, for example. And so the question is why or how how did the did the the patent authority uh, decided about the patent fees? And uh, Sibylle and I we we did some research on this question, and I I want to show you just uh, some of the some of the uh, results we we found. Uh, so we find that uh, that people from the German Solverein, but not from Wittenberg, had to pay on average five uh, guilders more than people from Wittenberg. From other German states, which were not in the in the Zollverein, uh, eight dollars, uh, eight guilders more, and from non-German states, uh, also five guilders more, or nearly six. So these are the if you say, want to say that the country fixed effects of the discrimination, then you, we find that if if you had a patent of introduction. Uh, not a patent of invention, but a patent of introduction. The fees were, were two guilders higher, which uh, might uh, mean that the patent authority thought that uh, the, the patent, uh, a patent of introduction was more profitable on average because it was uh, it was covering an innovation which has all already proven its worth uh, in a foreign country. Uh, other other things uh, are, are very interesting, but we might come back to them uh, in the discussion. So, Wittenberg, with this uh, discriminating patent law, uh, uh, caught up to other German uh, regions in the 19th century. And so, uh, is this just a correlation or, the, or is there some uh, causation in this? Uh, what can we learn from such example? Is it really advisable for developing countries uh, to introduce the strict and fair patent law? Or is this just good for the, for the most developed countries, but not for the developing countries? So, there's the case that it might be good to have no 
patent law in developing countries. My, my third channel, Financing Innovation, uh, deals with the question that it's very hard for, for an inventor to find investors uh, to, to, to finance his innovation activities because uh, uh, he cannot prove that his new knowledge, his new ideas are, are, very, are, are, very, are really profitable in the longer run economically. And uh, so this, this in a, in a information asymmetry makes it very difficult to, to attract uh, uh, capital for an for innovator. And we, we might think, and uh, some economists do that, that uh, patterns might help to, to reduce this problem because patterns can be a signal for investors that here there might be something to invest in. On the one hand, a patent shows that the patent authority uh, consider a, a particular invention to be sufficiently new and economically exploitable. So this is, uh, in some sense, uh, a, a seal of approval uh, by the patent authority, which might help the investor. And it also indicates that the, the, the inventor has spent a lot of uh, financial and intellectual commitment to get this patent. So this is a sign of quality, and we can think about patents as a signal uh, in, in capital markets to, to attract uh, cap to investment. Uh, and we can also think about uh, uh, this idea that patents uh, help to finance innovation and uh, the idea that firms can choose uh, between different uh, company forms and combine both and uh, think about the life cycle of innovative company. Uh, the German patent, uh, the German business law has a, a very important uh, innovation in the late 19th century, which is the private limited liability company in Germany, GmbH. I explain it to you in a second. And uh, it might be that this private limited liability company was, was the perfect solution to, uh, for some, for an investor and the inventor to to found a new uh, innovative company. And if this uh, an, endeavor was successful, then in a, in a later life uh, period of this firm, there might be uh, the, the switch to a stock corporation uh, necessary to collect even more money. We have uh, four, four main corporate forms to choose from. There, there are some special forms in addition, but the, the main uh, are four. This is the ordinary partnership. Uh, this is the, the, the oldest form. Uh, with, with two or more partners, uh, all unlimitedly liable. Then we have uh, uh, the limited partnership, which is also uh, known uh, since the Middle Ages, uh, uh, that we have uh, one or more general partners with unlimited liability and one or more special partners who cannot participate in management but have limited liability. We have the corporation, of course. All members have limited liability and shares are tradable. And then we have this new thing, the private limited liability company, uh, uh, where also all members have limited liability and shares are not tradable, but they can, can be sold. And so what are the, the advantages and the disadvantages? Uh, uh, how much time have I left? Uh, you can go on for 20 minutes if you want. Oh, so this yeah, is a lot of time. No, I will not. I will not. I will, uh, but I, I don't have to so, hurry. We have, we have time. Okay. Thanks a lot. So, what 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 are the 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 the, the advantages of capital companies in, in in comparison to these private partnerships? Well, we have this limited liability, which uh, is very useful, especially for for investors who just want to invest money in a firm, but uh, who do not want to to risk the 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 total wealth. And it's also a solution of the hold up problem because capital is, is locked in, uh, in in capital companies. So an investor cannot uh, retrieve his, his investment uh, from the firm directly. So if you buy a share of a firm, you cannot uh, ask the, the other people uh, who, who formed this firm to give you your money back. You can sell your shares, of course, but you cannot uh, retrieve your money directly from the firm. So this helps uh, the, the firm to survive, even if one of the uh, original investors uh, don't want to go on. Then we have uh, advantages of the uh, GmbH uh, in, in comparison to the, to the corporation. There's a smaller minimum share, which, which helps uh, to build up uh, innovative startups. Uh, 
the GmbH has not has no need to publish balance sheets, which is nice if you have an innovative firms. You don't want uh, to to publish a lot of uh, uh, information about your uh, innovation activities. So, uh, not to be forced to to publish balance sheets might be especially nice for for an innovative company. And uh, another uh, uh, advantage of this corporate form is that. Uh, uh, the the founders they can uh, agree uh, that uh, the physical assets or intellectual property rights such as patents uh, can count it as as capital contribution. So if you if two people are getting together, inventor and the investor, then the investor can say, uh, well, we we build up a, a GmbH with with the minimum size of of twenty thousand marks. I give ten thousand marks, and you give your patent, which we evaluate as worth 10,000 marks. And so the, 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 the firm is founded. And the in, inventor has not uh, to, to come along with a lot of uh, money, but he can still get uh, an equal share in the firm. And so I think uh, that the, the GmbH was the perfect corporate firm to, to solve up the whole up problem between a penniless inventor and a wealthy investor. And we researched that a little bit more and to find uh, some evidence that this claim is true. And if you look at the, the distribution of, of business forms uh, across these uh, different types and across uh, different German sectors, uh, in 1907 in Germany, you see that uh, most of the German firms are still uh, ordinary partnerships. Uh, that uh, private limited liability companies, the GmbH, has 10% 10, uh, 10 share and the corporation uh, also about a 10% share. So still dominated uh, by, by this traditional ordinary partnership. But if you go into uh, new, new sectors in the, in the high tech sectors uh, of, the, of the early 20th century, like machinery or chemicals, you see that the share of private limited liability companies and of corporations is much higher than on average. Here together, they have uh, nearly uh, half uh, uh, of all firms uh, uh, in chemicals are organized at private limited liability companies or corporations uh, in the beginning of the 20th century in Germany. And you could argue, of course, these are uh, very innovative firms who need a lot of um, uh, outside money to finance their, their expensive innovations. And so these are the perfect corporate forms to do so. You can look at firm histories to get a better understanding of what is going on. I did this for, for, for a lot. Uh, just two examples. Uh, the first one is, is, is the Hacketal uh, Gesellschaft in BH and GmbH, which is uh, the idea was uh, to, 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 to insulate telephone lines and uh, telegraphic lines uh, against the influence uh, of, 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 of other of high, which is the word uh, of, of nearby power lines. And uh, this guy Hacketal, uh, he, he found a way to do so uh, uh, by, by insulating uh, the, the telegraph and telephone lines, but he had no money to, to, to build up a firm. And so he found the investor, uh, uh, Jakob Berliner, who was uh, owner of a telephone fabric uh, of a telephone company and uh, who agreed to finance uh, uh, this idea to develop this insulated uh, wire. And uh, they founded uh, a GmbH. Uh, so the, the inventor, Hackenthal, uh, put in this GmbH his patent and uh, Berliner put in money. And then we had uh, the foundation of this Hackenthal uh, Gesellschaft in BH. It became very successfully uh, also on the international markets. And so it, be, it was converted into a corporation in, in 1907 when more money was needed. A second uh, uh, company, which is interesting because uh, I think the compulsory working clause was the reason for, for founding this uh, company in Germany, the Deutsche Diamalt GmbH. Uh, it was uh, an Austrian who, who got a German patent which was protecting a baking aid. Uh, but uh, the, this, this Austrian guy understood that it was necessary to build up a German factory, otherwise uh, he would uh, that this patent would have elapsed because of the compulsory working clause. And so he found that uh, in the year he got the patent also a German subsidiary 
uh, the Deutsche Diamalt GmbH, which was also uh, partly uh, uh, financed by, by German investors and, and the Austrian inventor. Here I have a slide uh, where you can see uh, the, the newly granted uh, valuable patents. We, we distinguish uh, the valuable patents by their lifespan per firm uh, uh, per year. Uh, for for the sample of the most innovative German firms. So we have here all German firms uh, which had uh, at least uh, two, you know, two valuable patents in the period between 1877 and, and the First World War. And then we look at their performance and we distinguish firms that went public at the Berlin Stock Exchange uh, during their, their lifespan and firms which did not. And you can see that starting in the middle of the 1880s, firms that went public in, in Berlin at the stock exchange and, and raised a lot of outside money uh, had, mere, had more innovations on average uh, uh, and per year than the firms which did not. And this suggests uh, that, uh, that getting this, this money at the stock exchange helped to finance, uh, to, to grow. Uh, faster and to get even more innovations than before. So, like like I said, this is the subsample of all uh, innovative firms in Germany. Here we have uh, uh, a look at what's happening after a firm went public. Uh, so after the IPO event, uh, again we measure uh, patterns uh, per year, and you can see that there is a jump in, in innovation activity after the, the IPO event, uh, which is uh, significant uh, here in this period, and it's also significantly lower before the IPO event. So again, we can see that uh, a firm become, became more uh, innovative, measured by patterns, by valuable patterns, uh, after the after going public. So. This was fast, uh, I, I fear, but uh, I, I want to, to conclude uh, with this slide, and this might uh, also open up the, the discussion a little bit. So I, I want to claim with my talk here that we know less about the relationship between patent law and economic performance than we might have believed uh, 10 or 20 years ago. So uh, there are a lot of questions, there are a lot of hypotheses and not so much answers. And so a lot of work has still to be done. And uh, a keynote, I think uh, this is, uh, well, a good, a good objective for a keynote to, to inspire new research and, and not uh, telling all the people listening that there is no need for more research. So I think uh, the future research has, has to do four things. Uh, first, uh, uh, national researchers, scholars should complete their, their existing national patent databases. Uh, sometimes uh, we have just uh, some years covered or some subsets of, of patents covered. And uh, we have also to find uh, scholars from other countries which uh, are not, uh, where we do not have this historical patent statistics uh, to, to engage in this endeavor too. And, and add new national patent data to, to the already existing ones. We should, and I hopefully I have convinced you in that, we should study differences in national patent laws and administrative practice in detail uh, to understand better how these institutions influence innovation. So the formal and the informal institution, how they influenced uh, innovation activities in the countries. It's not just low fees are good and, and, and high fees are bad. It's much more complicated. The next step then would be to standardize the national data and, and compile them in an international historical patent database, uh, uh, even so that we know that uh, we cannot compare the numbers of, of patents uh, in, from one system to another very easily. We, we should still uh, get an uh, uh, international database uh, a standardized international database to, to do quantitative analysis on all the questions I presented today uh, to get a better understanding how, how different uh, provisions in, in national patent laws and different characteristics of, of, of countries which had these patent laws uh, influence the number and the structure of, of patent data. And so therefore we would need this uh, international database. And Fourth, we should enrich our patent data with, with additional information on the patent holders, uh, such as the, the business uh, form, which I just described. And, but you can get 
a lot of other ideas if you have uh, innovative uh, if you have private inventors you get you can get you can add data about their profession about their education uh, about their uh, wealth if you have firms you can add uh, data about their business form about the number of employees uh, about the technological sector and so on and so on and if you have all this uh, other data we can uh, again at the microeconomic level can get get a better understanding uh, of uh, of the relationship between patent law and economic performance thank you very much thank you so okay so we had a, an excellent overview of one of the liveliest stream in economic history of the last 10 years i would say we have time for questions i have uh, one question myself but uh, if somebody wants to come, uh, I, I give precedence. So, but you should come here, because otherwise you can cannot hear you. Okay. So, or uh, take one of these mics. Okay, please speak in the mic. Wait, 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 wait. Good idea. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jochen. Thank you for your brilliant uh, presentation and for uh, have summarized uh, so well uh, the stream of research uh, on this issue. Uh, I, I don't want to 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 add some question about uh, the future of this stream of research, uh, but uh, I would like to ask uh, a classical question that uh, very often we receive the, when they are going to present uh, papers on uh, innovation patents and so on, particularly in the last uh, few years. Do you have any policy implication in our research in the sense uh, that uh, with uh, the pandemic situation, the, the, the vaccine, uh, uh, we have produced in the last few years. Uh, this is a classical question. So we have uh, uh, to uh, add some lessons from history on from patent, uh, uh, with uh, more patent needed to develop innovation or vice versa and so on. Uh, so in a sense, uh, our historical approach could offer policy implications uh, to nowadays situation. Okay, thanks a lot. What uh, I, I, I have already uh, hinted at this uh, actual uh, discussion about uh, the usefulness of a strict patent law in developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there was this uh, on the on the one one hand this this, this strong claim uh, that that every country in the world should have a very uh, strict and, and fair patent law. Uh, and on the other side, uh, scholars, economists who, who believe that it would be better for, for developing countries uh, to have a relaxed patent law to give their, their own uh, firms the, the breathing room uh, to, to, to imitate foreign technology and, and uh, to, to sell it uh, in, at the home market without uh, fearing that a strict patent law would, would, would punish them. And well, I think uh, I have some sympathy for this view uh, because observing observing that uh, a lot of uh, countries in the past uh, owned their own development uh, uh, imitating strategies. Not it, it 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 has it has not started with with imitating Brit British technology. It has started even before, uh, but uh, since uh, the British industrialization, there were always countries which are now among the, the leading uh, economic uh, countries of the world imitating Britain and other countries uh, to catch up like for example Germany and Germany today of course is, is always complaining about uh, Chinese and others uh, product piracy but they did it in the past too and it helped uh, developing so my policy advice would be uh, for 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 developing countries uh, it, it's not the first thing you should do uh, is to introduce a very strict patent law thank you jacob or, Where do you want me? no it's i can try to write yeah you yeah, great uh, overview especially for someone like me who have no knowledge in this area but i have many students interested in the topic and as you went through your presentation, there were two things that I thought might be interesting for students to look at. 
the first thing is when you have a law, you have the question of compliance with the law. Mm -hmm. So one area that I thought might be interesting to look at, but you can confirm or reject this idea, is whether you are able to measure patent disputes. Is that something that's been done? Is that Would that be an area that you think might be interesting? What is your knowledge on that? That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that you talked about was um, inventors that had trouble getting finance for um, starting the the, the the invention mm -hmm. how do they get in in contact historically with investors are there formal institutions for this because i imagine if you are a quite um simple person with no network it's difficult to just go up to an investment banker and say hey can you how did that work would that be an area then for students to look into what is the link is it formal is it informal what's going on there that's the two things thank you thank you jacob to to very very good questions uh, to to the pen, patent disputes. Well, uh, there's not much work done about historical patent disputes. Again, Serena Khan has has, has done a little <laughs> has done a little bit, but she's she's the only one, uh, to my best knowledge, uh, until until today. Uh, in the moment, uh, our German group uh, we are we are trying to to get more information. Uh, 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 on, on this thing using uh, data uh, from from the courts and uh, also using uh, so we we are in the moment are researching we found that uh, indeed a lot of uh, german companies tried to get uh, foreign patents cancelled uh, by 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 saying that the compulsory working clause uh, uh, is not uh, complied to and uh, we are we are in the moment researching uh, the the law and economic side of this problem, and I think this is uh, very promising and and very under researched. So I, I could uh, encourage every student uh, to to do more in this field, but it's uh, it's not so easy uh, uh, to to get here the information because uh, often you you need uh, the material from the courts and, and so so. But it's 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 challenging, but also uh, very promising. Uh, when it comes to the question, how did investors, uh, inventors find inventors, uh, investors? Uh, this is also a very, very, a very important thing. Uh, I, I looked at, well, let's say about uh, 20 to 30 case studies uh, until now. Uh, and it's, it's also, again, uh, very, very hard to find because uh, if you look at business histories and so the, the whole question of of finance and and uh, and getting the investor is is not uh, well explained in in, the, in our usual uh, uh, business history, uh, but uh, until now I can say I have no, I have not found uh, a mark uh, something like a, a formal institution at least for the German case where where these both groups could meet in in the nineteenth century. Uh, it was often uh, that they they. They were uh, living in the same uh, city, or at least in the same region, and there, there might have been some some people uh, uh, getting them together. But there was no, not not, not a market for uh, where, where where this matching could take place. It's it's often more accidentally happened. At least this is my 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 impression in the moment. But I wouldn't say this is the, the end result. We have a, another question from Vera Zamani. Yes. You have uh, highlighted very well the fact that many inventors did not find enough finance and um, that in this, I mean, the patent gives an incentive in any case to uh, work hard and find uh, some ideas for because it will be an instrument to get some finance. But today we are looking at the opposite situation, namely patents allow uh, inventors to become extra rich, extra rich out of uh, the uh, <laughs> acceptability of it. You know? So uh, how do you account for this change? Uh I'm, I'm 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 very sorry. I haven't I haven't understood the argument. What what do you mean by by extra rich? Extra rich, yeah. Namely, as a result of the fact that they have found 
a, a vaccine, for instance, mm -hmm. no, and they okay. patented this vaccine, then they become extra rich as a result of uh, yeah. oh, okay. events okay. that happen. But uh, also in other cases, in the case of uh, uh, the software com companies, is the same thing. You know, uh, they become extra rich on the basis of a patent uh, that they uh, had at some point of time. So okay, I think this this comes a little bit to the to the question uh, about the 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 average value of a patent uh, or how how we distinguish uh, valuable and non valuable patents. Uh, to to my best knowledge, it's it's very skewed. So we have a lot of patents, uh, but only a few of these patents are, are really very profitable. So this is uh, it's not it's not a normal distribution it's it's a highly skewed distribution with 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 a, a very uh, a low probability that you get extra rich uh, with your patent and so this but this is this is something we we have to keep in mind uh, and that most patents do not lead to to a lot of profits but a very few do but this is always ex post knowledge, and the problem is uh, what's 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 with ex anti knowledge. So uh, how how still how how you could uh, is it possible that the guy who would get the the who would become extra rich when his patent would be exploited, uh, how would he get money uh, ex ante? And did he? And did he not? And so never became rich. So if you look at the vaccine. Uh, in, in Germany, we had some, uh, when it comes to COVID, we had some ideas about who would invent the best uh, vaccine, but we didn't think about the firm which did it, but uh, of, of another firm. And that uh, this firm got more money on the, uh, so I, I don't know. So it's it's clear that uh, that some people get very rich with their patent, but it's just a very small minority of all patentees. And this is not solving the the financing problems because this is because this is always ex post knowledge. And uh, the question is how how did these people get uh, their money ex ante? Carlo, um, yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about the relation between patents and innovation activity. And um, can you please tell us whether this uh, link was uh, somehow mediated by demography? I mean, over the 19th and 20th century, there was, you know, the, the so-called, obviously, the demographic transition, right? So uh, how much and how the uh, variability of young labor force throughout history was a factor influencing the, the relation between patents and innovation. There is this story nowadays in Italy, especially so in Southern Italy, that we don't have uh, um, skilled young anymore because they, they, they go abroad, right? So mm -hmm. that, that there is no enough framework to develop new ideas and new technologies and new innovation and so on and so forth. What about this relation with demography and innovation throughout history? This is, this is very interesting uh, uh, because uh, uh, I, it, it comes to my mind that there might be also a, a quantity quality trade off in, in, in patenting in, in the, at the end of the, the 19th century, uh, because uh, the, the time of the uh, uneducated private inventor who just uh, had some idea about a machine he built in his garage and so uh, was, was coming in some sense to an end in the 19th century. Uh, it was more and more uh, invention were based on on science, and and, and were produced by by research and development teams, uh, even in firms and in, 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 in laboratories of, of firms. So you could say that uh, uh, inventing became more education and science based in in the late nineteenth century than it was before, and uh, and this was. Well, one of the reasons you could say that the quantity quality trade of uh, took place uh, in demography because uh, now it was also more important uh, to to invest in the in the education of your children when 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 parents wanted them to become inventors. I don't think so that people uh, <laughs> parents thought so, but uh, I think there's uh, also uh, a positive influence of uh, of better education on on patterns. 
because it was necessary that, that inventors had a better education because the, the technological fields where inventions were mostly made changed in the 19th century uh, to, to fields like uh, electricity, uh, chemicals uh, and, and more advanced machinery. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, so I think we can close here. We thank again Jochen for uh, his excellent overview. It was and we hope to see you, Jochen. Yeah, I hope so too. We hope to see you in person in one of our next meetings. So yeah, I hope so too. Uh, do come to, we, we, we are waiting for you. So the next uh, so uh, points, uh, the, uh, what we should do, now is to go outside and we can make we should make a photo so you go outside in the garden there is a nice statue statue of a sisypho so you go there and we make the the photo and only after we have made the photo you can have lunch otherwise i, I, I don't have to go lunch. outside right <laughs> and uh, and that's it then we reconvene after lunch for the general assembly of the society Okay, Jochen, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Eh? Thank you for inviting me and hopefully soon. Okay, we, we keep Bye. in touch. I will write you after the meeting or Monday. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.